Today, I am here with the incredible Abby Wambach. Abby, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. You have been an advocate for women for decades. When was it that it struck you that you wanted to speak out and be that unwavering voice of support? In 2016, shortly after I retired, so now I'm outside of women's soccer, I got a call from ESPN and they invited me to that year's ESPYs, which is essentially um, the nationally televised award show that it's like the Oscars, but for sports, best play, best team, et cetera. And they informed me that they were gonna give me what they call the icon ESPY award. And they were gonna also give it to two other athletes that year that were also retiring. You may or may not know of them. Their names are Peyton Manning and Kobe Bryant, may he rest in peace. So when I got this call, I was clearly shocked and amazed that they were putting me in the same world as these other legends, right? And so we got on stage, we got the awards, and uh, all three of us turned to walk off stage, and something else inside of me happened that I wasn't necessarily expecting. I was gonna go celebrate, this is a big deal. This is like a great bookend celebration to my career. And this like low level of rage that I think that I had been experiencing my whole career really bubbled to the top. And as the three of us turned to walk off that stage, I realized that the three of us were walking into three very different retirements. You know, I was one of the highest paid women's soccer players during my time and my tenure, but I was only comparing myself to other women. And this was a moment for me that the world was comparing me to these other men. And here, the three of us were walking off stage to these very different retirements. You know, their biggest concerns were where they were gonna invest their hundreds of millions <laughs> of dollars, dollars right. that they rightfully earned. Nobody's trying to take their money from them. But my biggest concern, and this is true, that I didn't know where I was gonna get healthcare. I didn't know how I was gonna be able to pay my mortgage that month. I didn't have a job. And, um, and so, instead of going out and celebrating with my friends and family, I decided to go back to the hotel and really think about what was going on. And, and that there, that, that night, I decided two things. Number one, I would tell my story, that I would make sure that that next national team player who retired behind me would not share this experience with me. And I think number two, most importantly, that if this was happening to me, I understood deeply that this was happening to every woman in every industry, in every city, in every state, in every country around this world that you and me are retiring with less. And so I needed to go out into the world and tell this story because people don't know that this is true. Um, and, and, and so that was the moment for me that everything changed. And it's such a pivotal moment because your voice, you've been so outspoken and so impactful. And I just wanna say what happened earlier this year, the multi-million dollar payout for all those female soccer players. I know you're retired but you praised it and really, it's because of you and your voice. And so thank you for being such an outspoken advocate. Yeah, I mean, I would thank you for that. I appreciate it. I did, I did do a lot of work uh, while I played and since I've retired. There are so many women that came before me, some that uh, were directly involved in women's soccer, some that weren't, you know, the Billie Jean Kings of the world, women who have been outspoken about sports, women in sports, for decades, uh, even since Title IX was passed back in 1972. And, and honestly, the settlement with US soccer that our women's national team has just secured is, is truly a win for them, but also to me, it's a win for every person who has ever been marginalized in their life, who feels like they are not in the majority of where they live, where they work. Um, this gives people an idea, a possibility. You know, they say you can't, you can't be it unless you see it. And I think that that is what this settlement and this equal pay um, forward moving deal with, with US soccer is giving so many people around the world. It's going, oh, maybe I could have that. And by the way, like, it's not just about women. We're talking about all diversity because we are not free unless we are all free and right. equal. Right. Now I know you have a very famous commencement address, but I wanna talk about the one you gave this past May. 
I was struck by it. Someone sent it to me because they knew that I have this Empower community, and I'm always looking for inspirational speakers. And your address really spoke to me, so I'm going to bring you back to that day. And you said you were flipping the tables of power. You were encouraging the women to flip the tables of power. And you talked about living your solidarity out loud. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. And I think that this is a story most women uh, or any person who is marginalized can attribute and, and have, has experienced. I sit on a committee that decides uh, who will become the next Hall of Famer. I'm a Hall of Famer and I sit on a co committee of electors for the next Hall of Famers of US Soccer, US Soccer Hall of Fame. And I started doing some research on why there were so much, so many more men elected into the Hall of Fame than women. Uh, and, and I guess the average person would say, well, the men's team's been around longer, but there's a pretty good argument to be made that the women's team has been more successful than the men's team over time. So I started to look through the data and trying to figure this out. And uh, sure enough, this, this electors call, all of us congregate on a Zoom call to discuss the upcoming possible um, folks and candidates who could become uh, the next Hall of Famers. And I noticed that on the call, there were so many more men because you have to be in the Hall, Hall of Fame, Fame to become to an seat. elector, right? right? To become a seat at that table. And so I decided to speak up in this meeting and I decided to say, you know what? I think that we actually have to go back to the drawing board to make this process a little bit more just because the truth of the matter is a lot of elections have to do with popularity. Do I know the person? Is that person more in my wheelhouse? So if you have more male electors, more male folks who are choosing the, the next Hall of Famers, of course that number is never gonna equalize. So before the meeting, like most of us women do in the business world, we find a few of our friends and say, listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring up this topic. It might be a little awkward or uncomfortable. Um, can you please back me up or can you please amplify my voice, which is a, a common business term that we know. And so we get into the meeting and I say, before we get into the discussions of the possible candidates, I would love to say something. And so I said all of the things. Mm -hmm. I fumbled a little bit. Mm -hmm. I was nervous, like most of us are, when we are speaking truth to power. And my, my, my former teammates and some of my colleagues, they spoke up for me, all of whom were women. Um, and then something next happened that I didn't anticipate. Um, no men on the call said anything. And then this unique thing, surprising, more surprising thing happened after as I started getting text messages and emails from all the men on the call that they were saying to me, I totally have your back. I, I mean, I totally agree with everything you said. And I've been talking, I was talking about it with Glennon because I was devastated. I was so disappointed in, in the lack of conversation that, that, that never ensued in that conversation. But then all of this off channel chatter. There is no such thing as silent solidarity. And so this is not just a message to, to women as an explanation of what to expect, but this is, a, this is a message to the men and those who are in power that when somebody brings up something on a call, do not text that person after or email that person after and say, I have your back, unless you have their back in real time during the meeting. Right. There is no such thing as silent solidarity. And, and I think that that's why I wanted to speak um, about it in, in that commencement speech, because this I'm sure that this has happened to you countless times. Happened to me this summer. You got my back. Do right. you, Chad? Do you really, when, when your popularity is in jeopardy, we have to be able to risk something in real time to prove our real alliance and to prove that we can be allies. And people ask me all the time, what does allyship really mean? It means putting yourself on the line, in the moment, in a public forum um, to support the things and the people in your, in your business practice that you want. It is so important. And now I'm going to go to your famous commencement speech, which created the opportunity for you to write a book. Yes. And um, you have a quote, and I love this quote, so I'm going to read it. 
claim the success of one woman as the collective success for all women. What advice can you give women to get better at doing that? Mm. It is hard to see anybody else succeed around you. I understand that. Um, we have to give ourselves the grace of our own humanity first and foremost, but we also have to, to kind of widen our lens a little and see what that really is, right? If there are people around you that are getting promoted, that are getting raises, that are, that are achieving levels of success that maybe you yourself want, and they also sit with you in a marginalized place, whether they are more diverse, whether they are a, a woman, whatever it means, if somebody else has equal to or less privilege than you and they're achieving success, we have to celebrate that. Because when you get your success, don't you want the people around you, the people that can understand and, 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 and see the world in which you've lived and which you've come from, don't you want them to also celebrate you? I also know that it's hard. It, is, it, it takes a, an extremely secure person to see somebody else succeed and to want to celebrate them. One thing that I have, I'm proud of and have learned so much from our, my time on the national team is that we all had to stand in our own power. We all had to show up every day believing that we ourselves individually were one of the best in the world because if we didn't do that, then, then the link of the chain and the reaction of that in our system, in, our, in the way we played, in the way that we felt, if there was one weak link, one person who didn't believe that they themselves were the best, then that caused a problem in the, and it would create a negative chain reaction. We wouldn't win games, we wouldn't win tournaments. So it is a requirement on one of the best teams in the world to believe that you yourself are one of the best. That doesn't mean you're gonna win, win every game or score that game winning goal. It just means that when somebody else does achieve success, that's an opportunity for you now to turn up your own, uh, own volume. When Alex Morgan scored goals, I wasn't like, oh gosh, I was like, great goal. That's awesome. Now it's my turn. I think that sometimes when we see so many other people succeed and we, we live in our jealousy of that, it just, it really just means that we are jealous and we are insecure. And this is an opportunity for you to go th be human, be like, oh, I really wish that that was me. Of course, we all want to succeed, but we also have to see the bigger picture and how we get a group from where we are to where we ought to be is truly what it means to be on a team. Yes, lifting each other up. Yes. That's a great way to end our time. Thank you, Abby, for being here, and you're so inspirational, and thank you for all you do for all of the women. Thanks for having me, and thanks for everything that you do with, with Empower. I think that the more we talk about our stories, the, the sooner we will get to some semblance of equality.